Hey guys, here is a summary video of everything you need for your second physics exam for AQA. Now this is a really, really long video. There is so much stuff you need to learn in here. Loads and loads of equations, loads and loads of units. You have to learn these if you want to do well. To help you, I've written a ridiculously long revision guide, which you can get for free from my website or you can go and get it from Amazon. A scalar quantity is going to be just a number. A vector quantity is going to be a number and a direction. For example, distance is scalar, but displacement is vector because it's distance in a direction. Mass is scalar, but weight, which is your mass upon the earth, is vector. Speed is scalar, but velocity, which is speed in a certain direction, is vector. Acceleration and force are both vector, and momentum is also vector. If we're looking for the resultant force, we need to find the difference between them. For example, here we have 10 plus 10 newtons minus 5 newtons is going to give us plus 5 newtons, which is going to be 5 newtons in that direction. For the second one, we have plus 2 newtons minus plus 2 newtons, giving us 0 newtons as overall resultant force, so there is going to be no movement. Your weight is not the same as your mass, because your weight is equal to your mass times gravity. Your weight is measured in newtons, your mass is measured in kilograms, and gravity is measured in newtons per kilogram. So your mass will never change, but your weight will change depending on the planet, or depending on gravity. Which is why when they went to the moon, they were basically weightless so they could jump around. Another W here, work equals force times distance. Work is measured in joules, force is measured in newtons, and distance is measured in metres. So that one joule is equal to one newton metre. When you exert a force on an object, it is going to be squashed or stretched or deformed in some way. Here I've done an experiment for you. This is commonly known as Hooke's Law. What I've done is taken a spring, this is the bottom of the spring, kept marked in every single photo, and I've added weights onto the bottom of it. You can see that the length of the spring is getting longer the more weights are added onto the bottom of it. We can plot what happens in Hooke's Law, because it is our direct line, until we get to a certain point, and this point is the limit, of proportionality. Before that it is going to stretch. So the more force we add on as we increase force, the extension is going to be increased after we get to the limit of proportionality. No matter how much force you add on it is not going to stretch anymore. It is potentially going to snap. Force equals the spring constant times extension. Force is measured in newtons, extension is measured in metres, and the spring constant is measured in newtons per metre. Kinetic energy is equal to half times mass times velocity squared. Kinetic energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, velocity is measured in metres per second. And with this, the squared is just around the metres per second, so you have to do that bit first. A fluid can either be a liquid or a gas. Liquids are incompressible. Any examples like that word. 
or as gases are compressible. Pressure equals force over area. The units for pressure are pascals. For force, it is newtons, and for area, it is meters squared. I have seen exam questions which use newtons per meter squared for pressure. If they do that in the exam question, give your answer in the same format. I've also seen exam questions where they've done newtons per centimetre squared. So if the question is in that format, give your answer in that format. This is one that you have to pay attention to because they could be sneaky here. Pressure with a P equals height times density, which is a lowercase rho, times gravitational field strength. Pressure is measured in pascals. Height is measured in metres. Density is measured in kilograms per meters cubed, and gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. There is a lot of maths in this topic, and to give your brain a little break, here are some cute kittens for you to look at. Distance equals speed times time. Distance is measured in meters, speed or velocity is measured in meters per second, time is measured in seconds. Distance time graphs tell us lots of information. If we have a slope that is increasing, we are moving. And the deeper the slope, the faster we are moving. If it is a flat line, it is not moving. We can see that as time is increasing, our distance is not increasing. So in a distance time graph, the flat bit is not moving. We can calculate speed as the gradient. Gradient is up over across which is going to be distance over time. Velocity time graphs look very, very similar to distance time graphs, but are different. For example, at our flat bit here, it is now moving, but it is going at a steady speed. We can see that when they are increasing, they are accelerating. So we now know that acceleration is equal to the gradient. That's up over across or velocity over time. If we want to work out the distance travelled, that's the area under the graph. For this section here, it is a triangle, so to work that out, it's going to be half times base times height. For this section here, that is a rectangle, so that is going to be base times height. This section in the middle here is a bit more complicated because we have a triangle, a rectangle, and a triangle, so that is base times height plus half times base times height and the height is the height of the triangle there. Acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over time. We can work out the change in velocity by taking the final velocity and minusing the initial velocity and the time taken by taking the final time and minusing the initial time. Acceleration is in meters per second squared. Velocity is in meters per second and time is in seconds. Final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared is equal to two times acceleration times distance. 
velocity, final and initial, is measured in metres per second. Acceleration is in metres per second squared. And distance is in metres. When you are falling, when something is falling, terminal velocity is going to be reached when all forces are balanced. A velocity time graph for this would be very fast acceleration as the object initially started to fall. As the object started to balance out, that would slow. And when they reach terminal velocity, there would be no further increase in speed. When you're free falling under gravity, your speed is going to be um, 9.8 meters per second, which is the same as the value of gravity, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Here we have a Newton's cradle, which really elegantly demonstrates a number of physics principles. First of all, inertia. An object that is in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. An object at rest will remain in rest unless acted on by an outside force. So those balls in the middle are only going to move if something hits them. And those balls on the outside are only going to stop if something stops them. It demonstrates the conservation of energy, where the balls only slow down as they lose energy to other things. In this case, you can't hear it, but it's losing energy to sound, and it's losing energy to a bit of friction within the air. This will keep going for as long as there is energy within the system. And it also demonstrates Newton's third law, where for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And we can see this as the balls keep hitting each other. Inertia is where an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by force, and an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. You can put this into action if you are um, driving along and you have your seatbelt on, the car brakes. You would not brake as well unless you were acted on by force, that force being your seatbelt. Conservation of energy. N energy is never created or destroyed. It is only turned into something else. Here it has been turned into sound and a little bit of heat. And for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Force equals mass times acceleration. Force is measured in newtons. Mass is measured in kilograms. And acceleration is measured in metres per second squared. Stopping distance for a car is going to be made up of two things, thinking distance and braking distance. And you can see that the faster you're going, the more the stopping distance and the thinking distance increases. This is because for thinking distance, your brain needs to firstly see the image, the signal needs to get sent to your brain, needs to be processed and signal needs to get sent all the way down to your foot. And the faster you're going, the more distance you'll travel in the time that takes. Things that affect thinking distance going to be drinking alcohol is negatively going to affect it, taking illegal drugs is negatively going to affect it, but taking something like caffeine is going to positively affect it. Um, tiredness is going to negatively affect it. Things that are going to affect braking distance are the conditions of the tyres. So nice new tyres are going to stop much quicker than old tyres which don't have much grip on the road. The condition of the road, so a snowy, icy road is going to have much longer braking distance than a new road, or a road that has a lot of um, grit on it is also going to have a long braking distance, and the weight of the car. A heavy, heavy car is going to take much longer to stop. There are a large number of features in a car designed to make it safer. First of all, seat belts, uh, baby seats. Believe it or not, when I was brought home in the car, I was literally just put in the car. Uh, crumple zones at the front. Airbags. Are a few of the examples. We are about halfway through, so you get another tiny little mind break. Aren't these guys so cute? Don't they just inspire you to revise more? Momentum is... Mass times velocity. Mass is measured in kilograms. Velocity is measured in meters per second. And the momentum is measured in kilogram with a space meters per second. I know there's a temptation to put another line in there, but that would be wrong. 
the law of conservation of momentum says that momentum is always conserved, which in calculations means your momentum before is going to equal your momentum afterwards. So if you have two objects colliding, their momentum together before is equal to the collided combined object afterwards. A transverse wave goes up and down. From one point to another point, and this doesn't matter whether it's from the top to the bottom, from the middle to the middle, we have the wavelength. The amplitude is measured from the middle to the top, or from the middle to the bottom. The direction of movement for this is up and down. This could also be the direction of oscillation. And the direction of energy transfer is sideways. Here we have our longitudinal wave where we have areas of compression. and areas of refraction. We can measure the wavelength in this from one point to another point. The direction of movement is side to side. And so it's the direction of energy. Frequency is the number of waves per second. So if we look at this block here as a second in time, something that will have a low frequency, we are not going to see many peaks in one second. But something that had a high frequency, we would see lots of peaks or lots of waves within one second. You'll notice that for the high frequency one, it has a low wavelength, whereas for the low frequency one, it has a high or a long wavelength. If we want to measure the time period for something, that is 1 over the frequency. Time is measured in seconds and frequency is measured in hertz. There is a capital H and a lowercase z. Do not write lowercase both letters or uppercase both letters because they are wrong. If we want to measure the speed of a wave, we can use a ripple tank. Um, this here will go in and out of the water, creating waves. From this, we can measure wavelength and also looking at how many waves pass a certain point in a second frequency. Then we can use our equation um, to work out the speed of the wave. V equals F times lambda. To work out the speed of a wave, wave speed, we can take the frequency and times it by the wavelength. Our units for speed are in meters per second. Frequency is in hertz, capital H, lowercase z, and wavelength is in meters. Here we have the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray and gamma rays. Um, over here these ones are high energy and these are low energy. These are going to have a high frequency and these ones a low frequency. These are going to have a short wavelength 
and these are long wavelengths. Wavelength for radio waves can stretch into the, the meters, the kilometers, very, very long wavelengths. Our radio waves can be used for radio communications. Microwaves can be used for mobile phones and for heating food. Infrared are used for things like um, the button, the, the light on your remote control. You can also use it for heat sensing. Visible light is used for cameras in your eye. Ultraviolet can be used for detecting things like um, fake money. Um, X-rays are used for broken bones and gamma rays can be used for treating cancers or sterilising things like killing bacteria. Diffraction happens when a wave passes through a gap. Here we have a small gap and here we have a large gap. And the wave will curve around as it comes out of that gap. The amount of curvature, the amount of diffraction, will depend on the size of the gap. Refraction happens when a wave passes from one medium into another medium, say from air into glass or air into water, and it will change direction. So here is our normal here, move it down to here. Um, it will change direction as it goes through there. And the reason it changes direction is because the wave changes speed, but different parts of the wave change speed at different points. So this part down here that hits um, first is going to change speed, either getting faster or slower before this part of the wave up here, which hasn't changed uh, medium or speed yet. Lots of different surfaces would emit and absorb radiation. Some will do it better than others. Over on the right hand side you can see the practical, one of the required practicals that I've done for you. Good absorbers are going to be dark surfaces and matte surfaces. Good emitters are going to be dark matte surfaces. Good reflectors are going to be shiny surfaces. When we have two like poles they're going to repel but when we have two unlike poles they're going to attract. A permanent magnet is going to have a magnetic field which goes from north to south and we can induce a magnet, a temporary magnet, if we place something inside that magnetic field. Magnetic materials are going to be metals and that is going to include iron, nickel and cobalt. You can easily make an electromagnet at home. All you need is a battery, some wire and an iron nail. Because all an electromagnet is, is an iron core with a wire around it connected up to a current. You can use this to pick up things like um, paper clips or iron filings. When a current is passed through the wire, it creates a magnetic field around the wire. And this in turn strongly magnetises the iron bar thus creating our electromagnet. If you want to change the strength of an electromagnet, you can do two things. You can change the current. Or you can change the number of turns or the number of coils um, that the wire times the wire is wrapped around the iron core. For Fleming's left hand rule, we need to make our left hand in this shape here. So finger pointing out, thumb up, finger out. And your first finger is your magnetic field. This finger here is the current and then your thumb is the movement of the force. And what you need to do when you have an exam question is literally you can talk your hand until it fits in the right direction. So first was nice and easy. My field is going in that direction. My current is going in that direction. So the movement of the force um, is going upwards. This one here is a bit more complicated because this finger needs to be pointing in that 
direction. My current needs to be going down and then my thumb is going into the page. We can change the size of the force by changing the current. by changing the strength of the magnet or by changing the angle between the wire and the magnetic field lines. The greatest force is when the wire is perpendicular with magnetic field lines and the force is going to be zero if the wire and the field lines are parallel. Magnetic flux density is the amount of magnetic flux in a certain area and the equation that we use for this is force equals magnetic flux density times current times length. You'll notice really annoyingly that this is an uppercase I and a lowercase L. Our units for this for force are newtons. For magnetic flux density, they are Tesla. For current, it is amps. And for length, that is meters. While this is called a simple electric motor, there's actually quite a lot of physics going on here. And for this, we really need to use our Fleming's left-hand rule. So our magnetic field is going from north to south like this. Our current is moving actually in two different directions. On this side, it's moving in this direction. And on the other side, it's moving in this direction. So what we are going to have is that when the um, wire is moving past the south bit of the magnet, the force is going to be going down. And when it's moving past the north face of the magnet, the force is going to be going up. And because one side is being pushed down, the other side is being pushed up, it is going to turn around. A moving coil loudspeaker works by making a diaphragm attached to a coil vibrate. When we have a current passing through the coil, the force that is generated via the motor effect makes the coil move. Every time the current changes direction, the force reverses direction. So the coil is going to be going back and forwards, making the diaphragm go back and forward, generating sound waves. A moving coil microphone works with the same principle but in the opposite direction. Sound causes the diaphragm to vibrate, the diaphragm is attached to the coil. The vibration of the diaphragm moves the coil which is going to cause the coil to move backwards and forwards past the magnet. Awesome work for making it to the end guys, I know this video is a slug to get through. The rest of this is physics only. If our forces are unbalanced, for example, if this force is bigger than this force, we're going to have a turning effect, whether that be clockwise or anticlockwise. If they are balanced, if this force and this force are the same, then we are not going to have a turning effect. The moment equals force times distance. Moment is measured in Newton meters. Force is measured in newtons, distance is measured in metres. Force is equal to mass times the change in velocity over the change in time. Force is measured in newtons, mass is measured in kilograms, velocity is measured in meters per second, and time is measured in seconds. When a wave is reflected, it is going to come in, meet the boundary, and then be reflected off. Our angle of incidence is always going to be equal to our angle of reflection. 
So we can always say that I equals R. Your normal line is in the middle here. It is a dash line and it is drawn at 90 degrees to the mirror or the surface that the wave is being reflected off. If we have a sound wave instead of a light wave that is being reflected, we are going to get an echo. A sound wave is a longitudinal wave. It vibrates the air particles. And your eardrum in here will pick up the vibration of the air particles and turn it into sounds which your brain can interpret. The range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. We can use echo or ultrasound to determine distance and we can do that because speed equals distance over time. So if we know the speed of the wave, we can measure the time taken and we can calculate the distance. So um, a vessel exploring the sea can send down um, an ultrasound and measure the time it takes to come back. And the time it takes to come back will be shorter or longer depending on the distance. Now the really, really important thing to um, note here is that it is there and back again. So the time is double um, what it would be. Because the time it takes to get there and back is twice just the time it takes to get there. So if you have an echo and ultrasound um, calculation, you need to find distance. You need to think logically about the time calculation that you're using. Ultrasounds can also be used for medical imaging. Here is my massive bump. Here was my massive baby. And you can see the hard parts, the jaw, the skull, the legs, they are going to reflect the ultrasound much more than the liquid or the soft tissue parts. When an earthquake occurs, we can use the resulting waves to give us information about the structure of the earth's earth. P waves are primary waves. They are longitudinal. They can travel through solids and liquids which means they can travel all the way through the Earth. So if an earthquake happens over here, the P waves are going to go all the way through, including through the solid core. S waves are secondary waves. They are transverse waves. And they can only go through solids. So they can't go through liquids. And because of these two different types of waves and how they're detected on the opposite side of the Earth, um, this tells us information about the structure of the Earth. A converging lens is shaped like this, and this is a shorthand for it. It is used to correct long-sightedness. It's going to produce a real image, and it's a type of lens used in magnifying glasses. I have made many, many videos showing you how to do ray diagrams, but just as a quick recap, for a converging lens, your first line needs to go from the top um, to the lens and then on the other side through the primary focus. Your third, second line needs to go from the top through the middle. I should extend that line a touch. Your third line goes from the top through the focus until it gets to the axis, then it runs parallel with the axis and is going to be there. Then over here we are going to get our image formed and that image is going to be upside down. So the top is there and the top is there. 
Your diverging lens is going to be curved in like this, and this is the shorthand. It's going to correct short sightedness, it's going to give us a virtual image which is upright but smaller. Drawing a diverging lens, our first line goes from the top of the object to the axis, and then we need to backtrack through the um, focus on the same side. So I'm just going to draw a dashed line here, and then the line will actually go like that. And our second line needs to go from the top of the object through the middle. And where those two points cross, there is going to be our virtual image. Magnification is worked out by taking our image height and dividing it by the object height. And you'll be delighted to know that there are no units for this, so I won't be nagging about this one. Using a prism or water in this circumstance, visible light can be broken up into its different parts. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Red light is going to have a wavelength of 7 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Moving through to violet, which is going to have a wavelength of 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Frequency, we're looking at the other way around. So the frequency of red light is going to be 4 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Whereas indigo is going to be 7 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Everything emits infrared radiation, and this is the balance between the amount of energy or the temperature, the heat that is being absorbed, and the amount that is being emitted at the same time. This can tell us a lot about the temperature of an object by looking at the wavelengths that are being emitted. Now, a black body is an object in space which is going to perfectly absorb radiation. It does not emit it, it absorbs it. The generator effect is just an extension of Fleming's left-hand rule. When we have a wire and we move it through a magnetic field, we are going to be generating a current. In a transformer, we have a soft iron core. We have a wire which is going to be coiling around, and you notice there are a different number of coils here. We are going to be looking at varying the number of coils so that we can vary the um, voltage that goes into and comes out of our transformer. If we have a step up transformer, the secondary voltage is going to be greater than the primary voltage. So the voltage coming out is going to be greater than the voltage going in. If we have a step down transformer, the secondary voltage is going to be less than the primary voltage. So the um, voltage coming out is going to be less than the voltage going in. When we are looking at transformers calculations, we have voltage in the primary coil divided by voltage in the secondary coil equals the number of turns in the primary coil divided by the number of turns in the secondary coil. Our units for this are going to be for voltage, that is volts. And number of turns doesn't have a unit because it's just a number. You need to know that voltage in the secondary coil times the current in the secondary coil is equal to voltage in the primary coil times the current in the primary coil. And our units for voltage are volts for current, amps, voltage, volts, currents, amps. Our solar system is a beautiful, um, varied and fascinating thing. Starting with the Sun all the way over here, we move through Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and our moons. The asteroid belts with some dwarf planets in, I'll come back to these in a second. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and poor old Pluto down here, which isn't a planet anymore. It's just a dwarf planet. To help you remember the order, we have my very easy 
method just speeds up naming and then it used to be planets at the end but Pluto isn't a planet anymore so it's now my very easy method just speeds up naming if you guys have any other um, ways that you remember the order of the planets or anything else pop that in the comments below because I'm sure loads of other people would love to see what you come up with so poor old Pluto here it used to be a planet, it is now a dwarf planet. Um, I'll do a separate video on why Pluto is now a dwarf planet. But our dwarf planets are here, 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 and here. I'm not going to try and pronounce some of those names because I'm very, very sure I will get it wrong. Um, we have an asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and then another belt of large objects right on the edge. The galaxy that we live in is the Milky Way. And here you can see the Milky Way stretching across the sky. We are on the edge of the Milky Way, on one of the arms right on the outside. In the middle is a black hole. Here we have the life cycle of a star. It is going to start off as a cloud of dust and gas. And these are going to come together under the force of gravity. Because everything has gravity, no matter how small it is, um, no matter how large it is, it all has gravity. And then we're going to be a main sequence star. Our sun is actually a rather small star in comparison to most of the other stars in the galaxy, in the universe. Um, lots and lots of them are much, much bigger. Now, depending on the size of the star, they're going to undergo two different things. Our sun, being a rather small star, once um, the nuclear fusion that goes on in the centre has run out of fuel, it is going to become a red giant, and then it is going to cool down um, into a white dwarf or a black dwarf. If it is a large star, much, much more massive than our sun, it is going to become a red supergiant, it's going to undergo supernova, and then the dense, dense core of that is either going to turn into a black hole or a neutron star. Now, our sun is a second generation star. Because after this um, red supergiant undergoes supernova, what we are left with is a cloud of dust and gas. And that cloud of dust and gas can get together again to form a new star. And we know this is because the sun has heavy elements. Things like iron are present in the centre of the star. Which means, since we were created from this cloud of dust and gas, which also formed the earth, that you literally used to be a star. You are a star. You are made of stardust. You are a star. You can tell people that. In the centre of a star, we have loads of hydrogen and helium. And they're going to be fusing together. This is nuclear fusion. Not fission that takes place on reactors that we have on Earth, but nuclear fusion. And we can see that massive amounts of energy is released. And this is energy as light and as heat energy. And if we were close enough, we'd be able to get the heat of sound energy as well. When all of the helium um, and hydrogen nuclei in the middle run out, that is when our star's um, life comes to an end. Now, our star, our sun, is a main sequence star, so it's going to have heavy elements as well. They are going to be undergoing the same process but the majority of um, elements inside a star inside the majority of stars in the universe are going to be hydrogen and helium an artificial satellite is going to be something that we've put up into space to orbit the earth whereas a natural satellite is going to be something like the moon which naturally orbits the earth a satellite is just anything that orbits the earth they maintain their orbit around the Earth due to gravity. 
there is a key distinction between the terms speed and velocity. Speed is how fast you are going. Velocity is how fast you are going in a certain direction. So speed is going to be a scalar quantity and velocity is going to be a vector quantity. If something is going in a circle, for example, orbiting the planet, it can be going at a constant speed, but it is not going in the same direction. If it is going in the same direction, it would always be going like that, in straight lines. So it is constantly changing direction, which is why you can have a change in velocity while going at the same speed. When we are looking at stars, we can see light coming from them, and the wavelength of light can tell us things about them. If the wavelength has increased, the frequency has decreased, it means the wave is being stretched out, it's moving away from us. When the wavelength is increased, the light that's coming from these stars is going to look red. We can say this is red shifted. Sometimes the light coming from these stars might look a bit blue. When stars look a bit blue, it's because the wave is being squashed. It has a decreased wavelength and increased frequency. That means that the star is coming towards us. The majority of stars in the galaxy are moving away from us. You're going to get uh, maybe a dual system where one is moving away from us, one is moving towards us. So one might show red shift and one might show blue shift. But the majority are moving away from us. And because they are moving away from us, we can make the reverse assumption that at one point they were closer to us, really close to us. Or that at one point they were in the same place as us. And this is how red shift gives evidence for the Big Bang. You are an absolute superstar for getting to the end of this video. Well done. All the best in your exams. I'm keeping all my fingers and toes crossed for you. Well done for making it to the end of the video. I know that was a bit of a long slog. But please remember, just watching this video is not going to be enough to get you a fantastic grade. If you really, really want to do well, you have to practice loads and loads and loads and loads. Which means doing as many past papers as you can. Which means doing as many questions from workbooks as you can. And it means putting in lots and lots of hard work. Just watching this video isn't going to be enough. I've done loads and loads of things to help you over my website, loads and loads of videos to help you. In the revision guide, there are loads and loads of lists of things you need to know with links to videos if you can't um, work it out for yourself. But please, 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 don't think just watching this video is going to get you a fantastic grade. You have to practice loads.